Yeah, go ahead and get you a seat. Hopefully when you came in tonight, you got an outline. You got an outline that says where the Lord is. Where the Lord is. Hopefully you got that outline when you came in. If you didn't get one, if you'll raise your hand, I imagine Dave and them will get you one. I see he's got a few extras. Need one up here in the middle, Brother Dave. Over here on the side. Up here in the front. My Lord, we need them everywhere, Dalton. Just start throwing them at people. Sorry I was a little late getting in here with you. Uh, Taylor, girl, where'd you go? There she is. Taylor just accepted the Lord as her Savior. Y'all give. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I tell you what. I walked up. I saw her. I said, hey, baby girl. Because she's, she's come to church with her Aunt Linda since she was little bitty. I, I pastored her when... Uh, I longed for there was a victory church. And uh, so I said, hey, baby girl, how you doing? I ain't got to see you. And she said, I'm doing good. She said, after church, I want to talk to you because I want to get saved. And I thought, well, we're going to wait till after church because the Lord may come back right now. So, so let's, let's get to that. So that's why we were a little bit. That's why I told Art, if, y'all just, if I ain't in here, we'll go ahead. But she was, the Lord had really walked her up to a good point, And she's at that point of just pure relief and, and happy knowing she's walking with the Lord. And that is, that is a great great deal isn't it amen boy that we have seen we've got to see brother david and i were talking between services funerals um and different uh, uh deals uh that we've all been involved in brother jim and and everything we are looking at all now a little over a hundred something salvations in less than three weeks so uh man just be praying god's answering a lot of a lot of prayers and dealing with a lot of people and um, and 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 we just thank God for that. That's always, you know, that's always encouraging. When people are they're coming expecting to meet with God, and God's dealing with people. That's when it really gets outside of just stuff that that we're doing as a church. And that's always so and so encouraging. And um, Christ died for uh, for just us each, all individually. Amen. And it it it's as big a deal for the Lord to save one as it was when He saved me and you. Amen. Amen. Where the Lord is tonight, if hopefully you got that outline. If not, just take one from your neighbor there. Um, and uh, we're going to jump into 1 Kings over in your Old Testament, chapter 19, a passage that we will, you will definitely know inside out, especially those of you guys that have come on Wednesday night. This is probably going to be about the fourth sermon that I will preach uh, to you from 1 Kings 19, then probably starting this week on Sunday mornings be preaching another set not the ones that you've heard um and we may we may we may look in and around this chapter uh over the next few weeks as we really talk about a vision um a direction uh, the lord's really laid on my heart he is already moving uh in a lot of things today we are um uh, i was telling you i said on sunday there's some just some real crazy stuff looks like the lord's opening up i was kind of um considering today what was going to happen sent off brother david uh to uh to do a little work and that's all looking positive coming back and it some of this stuff is going to be absolutely nuts the great thing is is whenever you see that you um uh and and you see god answering prayers in every area uh the main areas that we're going to be talking about with the church um really 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 encourages me we're seeing a lot of people come to the church that are already saved uh people that have been working in churches i've had now this last week three people three couples in the last week and one individual that have come to me said brother todd we don't know why god's moving us but we know he's moving us here but we don't know why these these aren't people running from trouble it's that i I told him i said well some of the things i'll be talking about in the next few weeks the lord has always sent us help when he knew that we were going to need it um, and so he's doing that. Um, uh, the school is getting kind of rolling out a little bit. The, the, our, uh, our, our little daycare, Kingdom Kids, is going to be starting up. Uh, we kind of introduced that last week. For those of you that are interested, there's a new, some new information coming out. One of the things we'd failed to do was to let people know about a discount if you have multiple kids. And, because that, and then the four-day price, uh, we were able to change it and lower it to help people out. So... So the Lord's opening up some things there. 
um, and it's just it's 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 been uh, it's 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 starting to be um, a, as we would say fun. Not that the not that there's not issues, but I just like to see it when God confirms things, and the, the Lord has had me slow rolling this in my mind until He was He had me pressured to the point that I was about to pop, and then. I can see now I'm in this timing, and that always encourages me because where I've in my own life and ministry, there's a lot of times God has let me know a thing, but then sometimes I, I tend to want to start things too early, and God doesn't give me a timing. And so that looks like the Lord is just opening all of this up. Now, saying all that, I draw your attention with me tonight to 1 Kings chapter 19. Um, there is a place where the Lord always is. And if you know what that place is, then you can always go for direction, you can always go for correction, you can always go for protection. Amen? The Lord is always in what He says. He's always in what He says. Now, in this story, in 1 Kings chapter 19, if you hadn't got to be with us, as I've talked about this off and on through the last oh, couple of months, and, and touched on it some on some Wednesday nights, looked at some practical lessons out of this chapter, 1 Kings 19, the prophet Elijah, who was one of God's great men, uh, in chapter 18 has probably his most well-known victory, okay? Completely overcoming the prophets of the false god Baal and Ashtoreth. And, and we see him just absolutely at the pinnacle. The chapter 19 starts with Ahab, the king's wife, Jezebel. And even if you've never read your Bible, you may have heard that term. Oh, Jezebel, has come to become synonymous with a wicked woman, um, decides that, well, I tell you what, I'm going to get old Elijah killed. And Elijah, for some reason, takes off running. Um, and this, we've talked about this at length. You know, you, if you remember when Jesus, before Jesus was tempted, he spent a lot of time in prayer. He was tempted, then what did he do? He spent a lot of time in prayer. Right? Jesus didn't make the Elijah mistake. He, he, when he was tempted, a lot of times we get our victory and we go, woohoo, I'm invincible. And then we, we quit moving forward and all of a sudden the devil gets us. Sometimes your, your worst day can follow your best day. And so, and, and, and so what, what he does, of course the Lord did, is he went back and got strength. Elijah didn't do that and he took off running. He ran to the point that he was in absolute desperation and depression he finds himself under a broom tree. We talked about that a little bit last week, how God, how God encouraged him, how God provided for him, and how God gave him strength to ultimately get to a cave. Now, when we see Elijah in the cave, we see it's very much a cave of depression, but nonetheless, he was protected from Jezebel, and he could begin to hear God. And what God told him was to go. He asked him what he was doing there, and Elijah gave him his reasons, and he tells him to go out of the, out of the cave. And Elijah doesn't do that at first. But we see, it says there in verse um, 11, he says, go out, stand, and this is on your outline if you don't have it open, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Now we know Elijah didn't do that immediately. Okay, because we're not going to read about that till, till uh, other verses. But it says, behold, the Lord passed by. A great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. You think of that hurricane that's out there right now, and y'all be praying for Haiti. Boy, we're, wanting, we're just praying that that misses north of them right now. Mole St. Nicholas, if you've read any of your, that's the southern track they think it could follow. And Mole St. Nicholas is so close. To, that is the first big city close to uh, Reverend Francois and them there in Crev. If it hits, they're up there in that northwest corner. Um, but you, we've seen some video today of that hurricane just destroying trees. But guys, this one destroyed the rocks. Okay? But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, while the Bible does not say specifically that God was in the still, small voice, it's that voice of God that Elijah starts responding to. So we know the Lord was in that voice. Does that make sense? The Lord was not in the things he was not in. But he was in the thing he was in. I know that sounds kind of simplistic. Okay? 
It doesn't matter how loud something is. It doesn't necessarily mean God's in it. Every, every casual observer would have said, God is in that earthquake, in that fire, and in that wind. But Elijah knew he was not in those things, but rather, he was, and God was showing Elijah that I am in the things that I say. Now, knowing that, you get to verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel, the king over Syria. You shall also anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Abel Mehola, and you shall anoint as and you shall anoint him as prophet in your place. It will be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there. Now, you say, Brother Todd, what in the world does that have to do with my life? Well, give me this. God talks to Elijah in a still, small voice. When Elijah hears that voice, the verses we didn't read, 13, 14, say that Elijah put his mantle on him, on himself, over his head, and he went out to the door of the cave, right? God asked him the same question again. What are you doing here? Elijah gives the very same answer that he gave before. So, right, he feels the same, but his position had changed. We talked about that last week, right? Coming to a position where you believe in God because he left the cave and went to the mouth of the cave. Now, he didn't take off running after the kingdom of God. He wasn't after the command of God. But he did step. And when he stepped, the next verse is verse 15, where the Lord says, go. Go, return on your way. God picks Elijah up from his cave and puts him right back into the same position he was in. He doesn't give him a time of correction. Elijah's had that. He gives him something to do. And Elijah responds to it, verse 19, so he departed from there. Now, if you look closely at these verses, you see primarily that God told Elijah three different things. Okay? And Elijah believes that God is in those three different things. He knows God's in them because these are the things God has said. God showed him, I ain't in the wind, I ain't the earthquake, I'm not in the fire, but I am in what I'm saying. And Elijah believed God to the point that when God, when he heard that voice, he moved to the mouth of the cave. It was, it was God's presence in God's word that moved Elijah. And when God saw Elijah move to his word, what did he give him? More word. If God's calling you to be saved, don't be talking to God about saving your marriage. You ain't there yet. Don't be talking to God about ruling your finances. Don't be talking to God about your addictions. Because what is God saying? God is saying, respond to what I'm saying. A lot of times God says stuff to us that we don't like. So we discount it, waiting on God to say something else. And God won't say it. A lot of times God will say a thing and shut up. Do you know that? I'm telling you, you, you'll learn that the hard way if you're a hard head like I am. I've learned that the hard way. God will say a thing and shut up. And we'll wait around hoping for God to change his mind or come up with something else, have a fit, what, whatever it takes, to get God to say something else. But God don't say anything else. In fact, he doesn't say anything at all because he's already said what he means. Does that make sense? If you don't respond to what God's given you, don't expect anything else. I had a guy one time in church, Lord, help him. He just didn't want to believe, but he wanted, he wanted his conscience eased. And he came, and he would talk to me, and we would just talk forever. I mean, he even wore me out, and I was trying to help him. And, um, uh, and I, I kind of in my gut knew he was full of bull, but I just didn't want to say it, right? I kind of had, I hadn't aged like I have now, where now I just kind of, can I tell you something you don't want to hear? Let's just jump ahead, you know? But, but then, so I put up with him. Well, he comes, we, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, we were having it, and some of y'all remember Mark and Becky Green. 
And so this guy wants to talk to Mark. Now, he, Mark's just the guy that's come in to lead this thing, but he's heard about him. He, he wants to come in and sit down with him, have this big talk. I said, brother, if he's got time to talk to you, fine. So he goes in, he makes this big production about all these things he believes and he doesn't believe and why he needs to see this and that. And Mark just cut him off and he said, look, man, you're at a point you don't want to believe anything God has told you, so there's no use in me telling you more stuff because you don't want to believe, you're just not going to believe it either. So I'm done talking to you. And the guy was like, he never heard a preacher just tell him like that. Well, he was mad. And I thought, well, you know, man, old Mark was hard on him. Then I thought, hold on a minute. He's been mad about everything I've said, and I walked him up slow. And, and he was mad about everything Mark said, and Mark got to him quick. And I thought about John the Baptist and Jesus. They came from two different angles, and people didn't want to believe. And you know what? I was cut loose of that guy, and God never gave me a burden for him again. As far as I know, he's dead now. I don't even know. I mean, it's just like, you don't want to believe? Fine. God told him in Jeremiah, he said, they'll believe or they won't. But as for you, you go tell them. I don't, what they're going to do, who knows? Okay? You've got to respond to what God says. Now, when, when he responded to what God had said, God gave him three more words. They're on your outline. They're numbered one, two, and three. In verse 15 and 16, we see that, that the Lord was in a word of command. The Lord was in a word of command. Let's just get one, two, and three down. You might, y'all might decide to jump up and run out of the sermon here in a minute. At least let's get these three. The Lord was in a word of command. In verse 17, the Lord was in a word of covenant. A word of covenant. And number three, in verse 18, the Lord was in a word of comfort. That's what I mean when I say God basically moved in Elijah's life in giving him three different words, okay? There was a command, there was a, a covenant, a promise, right? And there was a comfort. You see those three? Say them to me. There, the Lord was in a word of. The Lord was in a word of. And the Lord was in a word of. Okay? Look up there at verse 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, Go, Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. You shall anoint Jehu, and you shall anoint Elisha. See him? The Haziel being anointed is an odd thing, because Haziel was a king of a Gentile nation. In fact, he was the king of what was predominantly an enemy of Israel. But he's got a Jesus name. That's a, that's a Jehovah name. See how it ends in the word El, E-L? That's always a, that's always a giveaway. El, uh, Elohim, the plural of, of God. You'll see El Bethel, right? The house of God, that kind of thing. And so he's, he's, got, a, he's got a Hebrew name, but he was a Syrian. And, and God goes outside of where Elijah shouldn't have had any influence at all. And, and gave him a word. Here I'm going to try not to do a whole lot of talking about things God's revealed to me in a rhema. We'll talk about that on coming up. But then he sent him to anoint Jehu. Now, Jehu was a replacement. Ahab's family is about to be cut off. Jehu ain't kin to Ahab. And God is going to completely cut that line and lineage out of, out of God's people. Okay? He's about to be king of Israel. Elisha is going to, be a, he's going to take Elijah's place. He's going to be a prophet. This is going to be the person that is working specifically and directly with the people who, who are willing to believe God. Does that make sense? Two kings and a prophet. An outside king, an inside king, and a prophet. Okay? You say, Brother Todd, what does that have to do with the Lord being in his word? Well, notice that it was a word of command. It was a word of command. We see here two things. You first see the principle of priority. If this was the only occasion of something like this in Scripture, we, we couldn't make too much of it. But one of the things we see very often before God does big things, miraculous things, is He gives us a point to obey. Did God need Elijah to anoint these two kings and a prophet? No. 
Elisha is going to minister with a double portion of the Spirit of God that Elijah had. And Elijah is one of the most powerful prophets that ever walked the face of the earth. God didn't need Elijah to give Elisha a double portion of his spirit. Right? Y'all following me? Did Jesus need water in the water pots to, to, to turn it into wine? No, but what did, what did he say? He said, go fill those water pots with water. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, a lot of people took baths in Siloam, never, at, at Siloam, never got, uh, never got a healing, Jesus. Y- y'all following what I'm saying? God gives us a point to obey. Now, what does, what does that really, what does it really give us an opportunity for? When God says, obey me in this, go do what I'm saying in this, what is he giving us an opportunity for? You say, well, Brother Todd, obviously obedience, that shows what? Belief, faith. You don't believe God until you're willing to act on your belief. People say, I believe in God. Uh, I believe in God that God's going to bless me financially. Not if you don't believe enough to tithe. Because that's where he says the source of the blessing is. It's in the tithe and the offering. You can say all day long, I believe in tithing. You don't believe in tithing if you're not tithing. Okay, And don't be one of these people that says, well, I tithe 2%, because you don't tithe 2%. Tithe means 10. <laughs> you might give 2%, but you don't tithe it. Tithing is a 10, right? It's, just, it's redundant. It's like when you go to the Mexican food restaurant and order cheese queso. <laughs> How many of you see people do that? Ain't that funny? I want cheese cheese. I want cheese cheese. Once in English, once in Spanish, right? That is what queso means, right? right? Okay. Check out my brother, make sure I'm doing, saying it right, right? Cheese, cheese. Okay? But what, what the Lord is, is, gives us to when he gives us something to do is we have an opportunity for faith. What does the Word of God say? It, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So a lot of times, the things that God calls us to, to do, while we might say, well, you know, why should I do something like that? is because it, it, it's not going to produce the miracle, but it is going to bring faith. And if there's no faith, guys, there's not going to be any miracle. Does that make sense? We can believe that God is going to save the lost all day long, but if we never tell anybody about Jesus, why, sh- why would we ever think that we're going to see the miracle of salvation? Right? Amen? You want God to bless your marriage, but you won't, you won't lead your home according to the way that the Lord says to do it. But you want his blessing, but you don't want to do what he says. Because we're so rebellious, but what we don't recognize is that is where God partners with us. If you got that, say, I got it. Amen. If God's calling you to do something, while you might think it's too small and inadequate to actually get, to get done what they need, because those servants didn't say to Jesus, look, brother, I know you ain't listening. They said they wanted wine. You told us to go fill it with water. They didn't do that. The Bible says they filled them to the brim. And that wasn't an easy thing back then. Them them, them barrels were made out of stone. And they held 20 or 30 gallons of water each. Now go moving them things around. They didn't make them out of wood. They made them out of stone. They was heavy enough without water in them. But they filled them to the brim. And then Jesus said, now go bear it out. And they went and bore it out and carried it to the governor of the feast. I don't know when it turned into wine, but it did. Amen? And the neat thing about that, and while I'm not going to preach on it, I will just comment on it. It's different. Is that, is you remember the governor of the feast there in John 2? The governor of the feast said, hey, guys, you know, what you do is you normally bring out the good wine first. And then when everybody's well drunk, in other words, they got their buzz on, you bring out the cheaper wines because they don't know the difference. He said, but y'all have kept the good wine until now. Y'all have kept the best back. The Bible says there that no one knew where that wine came from, parentheses. John says, but the servants knew. They knew. Guys, I'm gonna tell you, that's, where you, that's where you want to be in the church. Where, when everybody's running around going, boy, God doing this at Victory and that, and boy, that church over at Victory and them people over, and you're like, no, it was water when we poured it in. 
But we saw God do something that only God could do, and, and they were included. They were the ones that obeyed, and they were the ones that were included. Nobody else knew where the wine came from, and Jesus didn't stand up and go, ah, ah. Hey, wine come from me. Jesus what really looks very reluctant about even doing the miracle there. Because Mary, his mama, comes to him and says, they run out of wine. And what did Jesus say to her? Woman, what, what do I have to do with that? It ain't my time. I'm not, I'm not started my ministry, as it were. And she looked at the servants and just said, whatever he tells you to do, do it, and left. Figured Jesus wouldn't leave them in a lurch. The only people that knew were Mary and those servants of who was given that supply, but they were the ones that were connected to it. And that's where you got to live in life. Amen, baby, that's right. Amen. I can't get an amen, I'll get an ah! Yeah. Right? Guys, when God calls us to obey, he's not trying to ruin our life. I'll tell you something else. If God calls you to obey, it'll give you an opportunity for faith, and where God calls you to do will not wreck your life. If God gives you a direct command, it will not wreck your life. So many times we think that God's going to, he's trying to ruin us because he's taking all the fun out of life. God's commands won't take the fun out of life. They'll take the danger out of it, the real danger. Maybe not the danger to your flesh and blood because sometimes living for Jesus to get you in a bad spot or a difficult spot but it will not wreck your life. There ain't nobody ever led their home based on what the Word of God says that at the end of the day said, I wished I'd have never followed the Word and will of God. Okay, we got to go quick. because I'm, I'm going to try to get y'all out of here faster. Last Wednesday night, what time did y'all get home? It was almost 10 o'clock when I showed up. Anyway, my wife thought I'd been out running around. I said, Baby, I was at the church. She said, I'm calling somebody. No, I'm just, just checking. I did She's over another bed, yeah. And if I want her to hear that stuff, I, you don't tell on me and I won't tell on you, amen? Matt Gross? Matt? You ain't got your fingers crossed about that. Matt's like, I won't tell, Brother Tyler. Okay. You got, my own, you got your own wife, amen? There's the principle of priority. Secondly, there's the principle of power here. And what I mean by power here is the power to succeed in what God tells you to do. Now, Jezebel's still out hunting Elijah, right? As he heads off to see to Syria, and as he heads around to find Jehu, and he heads around to see Elisha, he was an open target. He wasn't, he wasn't protected by that cave anymore. Y'all following me? What if Jezebel had run him down while he was headed to go anoint Haziel? What if she'd have run him down and killed him? Would Elijah still have not been successful by being out to do what God told him to do? Would he not have been successful in the eyes of God if he was out trying to do what Jesus told him to do? I got news. Haziel is not going to be the king by the time Elijah goes to heaven. Jehu is not going to be the king by the time Elijah goes to heaven. In fact, Elisha is not even going to be the prophet with double the spirit of Elijah until God takes, remember, the reason I say he goes to heaven because Elijah is one of the brethren that didn't die. God just translated him straight up. A little picture of how he's going to do us when he raptures us. Amen? And I'm going to believe I'm going to get raptured until I, I fall over dead. Then I'll believe I'll be resurrected. Amen? Right? So could he, could he, could he fail? If he was doing what he knew God wanted him to do. Couldn't fail, could he? There's this, there, there was what made him a success. And we have to redefine our notion of success. Too many times our idea of success is we get notoriety from men and money in the bank. But there is nothing wrong with accomplishing God's will in your life and then falling on sleep. Amen? Finding out God's will in your generation, accomplishing it in your time as best you can, and when God is ready for you, he calls you home. Was James a failure because his brother John outlived him? No, James was the first of the apostles that died a martyr's death. And all he was out doing was what God had told him to do. 
And it was up to God to make sure Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha got anointed. But what Elijah was going to do was not hide in a cave. If she'd have caught him in that cave, he'd have been outside of God's will. And we could have said, oh, look at, look at, the, the, look at the failure. But that's not, that's not the case. So we see here that when God gives us a command, if we're doing it, then guys, we're already successful. And if we're doing it, then we have an opportunity for faith. If, if, that, if that makes sense, I want you, when I count to three, say, I got it. One, two, three. If that don't make sense, it's something I want you to have. When I count three, say, repeat, please. One, two, three. Okay. If it had been longer, that had been fine. I just started right back over at the top. It's something you got to have. God's commands are not grievous. They are opportunities for blessing. Amen? Yeah. Number two, the Lord was in a word of covenant. If you look closely at verse 17, God makes Elijah a promise. He says, It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever Jehu, whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Now, all of those brethren took their place of power once Elijah was gone. Okay? Why was Elijah hiding in the cave? Lord, I've been zealous for your work. But they, they beat us. I'm the only one left. Elijah ran into that cave for protection. And what here does God promise him? Your enemies... When you go out and do what I'm telling you to do, the fruit of who you reach and what you do is going to give all the protection my cause needs. It's a promise. It's a covenant. So here we see, first, the principle of faith. Elijah goes out and operates under this promise. I'm not going to fear Jezebel anymore. Because I'm going to go out and do God's work, and the result of doing God's work is going to kill whatever enemy needs removing. Ain't that what he says? Fear ran Elijah into a cave. Faith sets him loose. And I got news for you. In your life, you will operate in faith, or you will operate in fear. If you don't feel like your life's going anywhere right now, I would say, what you afraid of? Why are you still? Fear paralyzes us. Fear ran Elijah outside of God's will. Fear ran Elijah to a point of, of depression. He wanted to be dead. Fear ran him to a place of desperation. Fell, fear ran him into a cave. But it's faith that moves him to the door. It's faith that moves him back on his mission. Verse 19 just a very few little words. So he departed from there. God gives Elijah something to believe in. And as he acts in what he believes in, he moves. He's bold again. So many Christians aren't bold. Do we even know what we really believe in? Do, we, do you live under opinion or conviction? Conviction is something you'll die for. Conviction is something you, you can't quit on. I know God called me to preach. I have to preach. If y'all didn't let me preach, I would be sad, but I would not stop. I would just say, well, the Lord, you know, God help them. And then I, I'll find a street corner somewhere. I started preaching to three or four. It, it, I'm not, I'm not, I ain't got to have 3,000. Paul said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. See, because why? It's something I know. I know that, that Jesus is God. I believe that. I know that. He has called me to follow him. He has called me to declare him. He's called us to do that. Amen. Y'all following me? But you say, but Brother Todd, I'm, but I'm, but it's too many times I'm fearful because we're not focused on the things that we believe in. The more you know, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the more God will grow your faith. 
the, secondly, there's not only the principle of faith, that this is important, there is the principle of fruit. Fruit. F R U it. Fruit. I always get the you and I mixed up in my mind. I think I got it right. The fruit. <laughs> my little grandson Titus, he adds syllables to all the words. The fruit. The principle of fruit. Look at what he says. He says, Elijah, you go and anoint these two kings and this prophet. And what God doesn't say is this. And if Jezebel shows up, I'll give you the power to kill her. Not what he says. He says it'll be that whoever Hazael don't kill, Jehu will. And whoever Jehu don't deal with, Elisha will. Right? Elijah's protection. The protection of what he really lived for. What did he say? What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts and for the children of Israel. The things that he was really concerned about, God says the people that you go touch are going to be the people that I use to protect and lead and guide everything I'm doing. If you got that, say, I got that. You might not know where I'm going right now, but do you got that? Here is the principle of expansion. God is going to use the people that Elijah reached just like he used Elijah because there was a time in Elijah's life where somebody reached him, right? And Elijah became the fruit of their efforts. And God was going to expand it. He's going to take it from Elijah and he's going to put it in three places. Guys, the things that we really care about as Christians are going to be carried out by the fruit. It's one of the big things God's got me at in my life. For so much of my ministry, and I've always wanted people to be blessed, so don't, don't take this as me being just totally obtuse or short-sighted. I've always wanted everyone to be blessed, but I was always very much focused upon what am I doing and what am I going to do in the kingdom that's going to bring the blessing. And what God has showed me as a pastor and my time of life, it's what I get into you because you're going to be my fruit. And you're going to have fruit. And what God has poured into me, He's going to pour into you. And you're going to pour into others and into others and into others. If we ever see a real revival in this part of the world, it'll be because we multiply. God has never used just one person. God used the Holy Spirit. He'll use people. But if you'll notice, God, God takes Elijah out, and he, but, but he empowers more. Victory, we are only going to be successful if what happened in here on Wednesday night multiplies. And then as we pour into Taylor girl, and Taylor reaches in because she's already talking about bringing her family with her. Her brother is wanting to come. She's coming when, when you get, she works at Walmart, works on Sundays. So if y'all pray that she'll be able to get off this Sunday for a baptism. If not, we'll try to do it the next week. But she's already, you didn't even realize you were talking about this principle, you're already talking about the people you're going to reach. Why? Because that is where God's going to give the power. That's where God's going to give the blessing. Especially those of you that have committed to membership in this church. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Our word for us. I mean, we know that God's working in the whole world. But as he deals with us here, guys, that's where our increase is going to be at. And to have a heart for it. Talking about Javier a while ago asking about the, the cheese. But Javier brought him and Angelica to VBS, brought what? Typically 25 to 30 children every night with them to vacation Bible school. He said, Brother Todd, how'd they get them? They went and got them. Now, he probably didn't call any of them Haziel and Jehu. And it, are you following me? But it's that investment. Roy is sitting by, Roy, his brother in law, is sitting right here behind him. God poured into Javier, and, and that's who got Roy. And Roy was just a drunk. Right? I mean, I mean, he worked hard, but he drank a lot. He'll tell you that. His wife's sitting there nodding her head, like, oh, you don't know, Brother Todd. You know? Right? Went and got their kids. 
and invested in. Are y'all following me? One of the big things I'm going to be talking about with us is God's laid a new, a, not just a desire, but a, but a pathway, a plan that I think is going to help every one of us see more people saved in our own life. I'm going to talk about it on a Sunday um, as, as in detail, but, but the principle is in the fruit. Um, our victory is going to come in those we reach. Your victory comes in those you invest in. The success of my life will be much more gauged by what I poured into my family and my church than by how much money I leave for people to fight over in my will. Now, don't get me wrong. They're lining up to fight. I was with a group one time. They were in mediation. They were fighting each other tooth and nail. The lawyer walked in the room. He opened up the file, and he said, you people are fighting over this amount? He said, I'll tell y'all this, y'all better get along quick or everything y'all got is going to be mine. And guess what? They got along quick that day. He said, y'all, he said, I see people fight over real money, not this piddly stuff. That'll be, that'll be my day. Anyway, the Lord was in the, a word of command. He was in a word of covenant. He was also in a word of comfort. If you look at verse 18, God says something to Elijah that we have not seen anywhere in the story. Nowhere in the Word of God. When God was talking to Elijah at first, he never brought this up. But in verse 18, he gives him a word of comfort. Now, we know it's a word of comfort because if God wanted to condemn Elijah with it, he would have brought this up at verse, about verse 11. Okay? What does he say to him? He says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all those whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He tells him here that, Elijah, you're part of something that's bigger than what you know. He said, why are you here, Elijah? Basically, Elijah says what? I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. Now, if Todd had been God, I would have said, cotton picking, boy, I got 7,000 that ain't bowed down, and they ain't hiding in a cave like you are. Right? But God doesn't say it then. In fact, God doesn't tell this to Elijah until after he has recommissioned him, until he has told him to go, and he's given him three things to do. You see that? He makes a promise to him, and then after Elijah has a place to believe, God comforts him with a realization that, Elijah, it's bigger than you know. He does two things here that we can can wrap our minds around today. Two principles here. First, there is the principle of increase. Elijah gets told something here he doesn't know. And as he's told this, it encourages him because he's not the only one. What God does here is he increases Elijah's knowledge. He opens up more truth to Elijah, more of a reality, are y'all following me, than what Elijah knew. And the increase in in what God tells him here comforts him. Again, we know it's not a word of condemnation because that's not the time when when God speaks this here. Elijah doesn't know if it's going to be easier or harder to go get God's will done. All he does is he goes out to do it. He doesn't know what kind of hell he's going to deal with to get a... Haziel anointed and Jehu anointed and Elisha anointed. Y'all following me? All he knows is he knows what God's told him to do and he's going out to do it. And one of the things God gives him to help him with this and prepare him is that he increases Elijah's knowledge. God, God, God's got more for us than we know, guys. Okay? God knows where we're going and God knows what we need for the journey. Here, Elijah had convinced himself he was all alone, and God expands his knowledge. Now, I will tell you this. Sometimes God God only increases us for us to increase somebody else. He only increases us for us to pour out what he's put into us into somebody else. God is not interested in you being the Dead Sea. He is not interested in you being in a receptacle that has no outlet on it, okay? He pours into us, he fills us so that 
it overflows us and it touches others. Are y'all following me? But God will do this before a journey. God will do this before a difficulty. He, he increases our knowledge so that we can carry out His will. Hopefully you know more about parenting if you went through pathway to parenting than you've ever known. God gave you that so you carry it out. Maybe you know that God has saved you and He's taught you about His cross and He's taught you about His coming kingdom. He gives us that so we can go do something with it. Does that make sense? But He increases us as we need it. Make sense? Y'all being real quiet tonight. Amen. Is that already 9 o'clock? He increases us so that we can accomplish more. Now know this, to whom much is given, much more is required of him. And the more God gives you Wednesday night crowd, the more God will, want, will, it, will encourage you to do. We see the principle of increase. Secondly, we see the principle of inclusion. Because Elijah has convinced himself that he is all alone. And God is letting him know that the family is bigger than he thinks. And that he's got work to do in the family. Now, one of Satan's favorite little devices, if you don't know this, you write it down, is called isolation. Isolation. One of Satan's favorite devices is to get you isolated. Make you feel isolated. I'm going to give you two examples. They're two different forms, but the intention is the same. In David's life, King David's life, it says what? There came the time when kings went forth to war, but David remained at Jerusalem. David had had a life of war, okay? And now David is established in his kingdom. But the scriptures say it came the time when kings went forth to war, not the time when kings sent their nephews, their generals, Joabs, off to war. Right? Everybody close to David was gone. Now this, this is intentional isolation. David intentionally does this to himself. Now he's probably got all kinds of good reasons. I'm tired. I'm old. I need to delegate authority. I mean, he might have had all kinds of excuses. But nonetheless, as king, pretty much what he said went anyway, right? He had a very small group of people that could really speak into his life without David either getting their, chopping their heads off or whatever else because he could do what he wanted to. The principle is this. Me and you all have very few people in our lives that can speak into our lives directly that we don't resent it. You don't believe me? It's why you get mad every time your wife says, maybe you need to tighten up here or there. You resent it. And if your wife is even one of those people that she has to lovey-dovey you up, right? Now, baby, oh, I think you're so big and strong. And, I just, and then she got something to do there at the end of it, right? What she's trying to do is what? She's trying to avoid you resenting what she says. Your kids come to you, and they got a word for you. What do you tell them? Shut up. Kids need to be seen, not heard. Right? Your, your kids are sitting, y'all are fussing going home, right? You're driving in from work, whatever, ball game, up in the front seat fussing. Your three-year-old goes, Mom and Daddy, don't fight. You sit back here and you be quiet. Don't you worry about what we're doing up here. What is that? I resent them speaking into my life. And think of how close your wife, your kids are. How many of y'all got mad at your best friend when you asked them what they thought and they told you opposite of what you wanted to hear? You ever done that? So see, even you, you see what I'm, when I say we have very few people that can really come into our life and speak a thing that we don't immediately react negatively to it. You following me? Every one of those people was outside of David's sphere of influence. They were all off fighting the battle. His mighty men, they were gone. He ends up laying up with one of them's wife. Gets one of those mighty men, Uriah the Hittite, killed. Right? Because he made an intentional decision 
to get isolated because what? David, I'm a man after God's own heart. What's going to tempt me? I'm cotton picking king. I'm the anointed of God. God sent Samuel. Y'all remember Samuel, right? Samuel, come along. Samuel anointed me. Not my, not my brothers, me. And what happened? Real full of what he knew, real full of who he was. Right? Now, this don't affect y'all because y'all are here at church on Wednesday night. But let me talk to y'all about some Christians I know. They don't need life group. Because they ain't, they ain't a life group teacher in this church or in this county that can tell them, them anything. They don't, need, they don't need Brother Todd. In fact, their, their favorite Sundays are the days I come and just give an invitation so they can go home early. Because frankly, they know it anyway. They're glad people got saved, don't get me wrong. But they don't need it. I don't need no Monday night. I don't need no Brother Jim Everidge hollering at me. Now, the reality is, every one of us in this room will be lucky to ever know about prayer what Brother Jim has forgotten. Well, Brother Todd, he hollered at me once. Well, I holler at you, and you're here now. Your mama hollered at you, and you love her, you'll cry at her funeral. We know too much. And that, that's intentional isolation. We... we a lot of people need church every week, Brother Todd, but not me. Baby, you're David hiding out in Jerusalem. You don't need it. Always tickles me. Half the people that come to this church, I love them to death. But the reason they don't come on Wednesday night, and I didn't say all of them, but about half of them, they don't need it. Now you say, Brother Todd, are you being literal? Of course they need it. How much, you know, we need more of the Word of God in our life. You know, people always tell me, we go to church too much. You know, Will Rogers used to say that the government taxes the people to build the roads and the Baptists wear out the roads by going to church. Right? But we need more than we know. You need people around you that know about your life. If all you ever do is come to church once in a blue moon, blow in, blow out, ain't no, you're not accountable to anybody. But when you invest in somebody in life group or when you've given word into their life, then what? There's just, just The door swings both ways, right? Now they could speak into my life. Oh, no. Are y'all following me? Don't. No. I guess you can, brother. If you go, You're going to raise your cotton-picking hand. Come on up here. Boy, I was really about to bring it on, too, Bubba. No, I'm sorry. And I want you to bring it on. No, come on, this. come on. But uh, I was preaching today at the treehouse, and I told them, we feed our physical bodies at least 21 times a week. That's three squares a day. And we try to live off of feeding our spiritual body twice a week. Good word. If we're lucky. Right. If we go to church every week. Right. We try to live off twice a week. Which side do you think is going to win? There you go. The flesh or the spirit? Amen. Good word, brother. I like that. I like that. That's right at what we're talking about. We intentionally limit the connection to the word of God. Now, why do we do it? Why do we, why do we limit our prayer and things like that? Because it's convicting. Right? We do, you know, we resent everybody else that talks in our life. We resent the Holy Spirit when he has a correction to make. Right? So why don't we give him seven excuses before we go, okay, Lord, yeah, you're right, right? We, we look at, we, 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 we honestly so many times intentionally isolate ourselves. Now, secondly, let me tell you another story about isolation. Peter and John go to the temple. A man's laying there crippled. He's at the right place, but he's got the wrong mindset he's there to just get an alms he's not there for a healing anymore he's there to just get by he's lame peter says to him look at us the bible says he looked up expecting to receive an alm not expecting a healing and peter said to him silver and gold have we none and i know if that brother had been anything like me when Stephen, when peter said that i thought oh great Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, 
we give unto you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he rose up and walked. And running and jumping and praising God in the temple, right? You know the story. What happened? They grabbed Peter and John and they put them in prison by their cell. Next morning, they get a big group, their group, their hand-picked group. Church ain't invited. Of the very men that had crucified Jesus. And what does the Bible say they did with Peter and John? They brought them out and put them where? In the midst of them. Look at what the devil's doing. Surrounding them. Isolating them. You two nuts are the only ones who really believed it. All these reasonable people here. Don't you see all these experts in this group? See it? To make you feel small. That's why, some, that's why when you send your kids to university, you better have them ready for some hoity-toity professor who's been jacking with college freshmen for 30 years, who's going to get them in a room, and when they stand up for Jesus, he's going to shout them down, and he's going to have all them other people in there who's, by the way, future is dependent upon him giving them a C and not an F to agree with him that you need to hold that stuff quiet. Same thing. Trying to isolate. Trying to outnumber. You see it? What I'm asking you is look at, look at what happens. What is God doing here with Elijah? You're not alone. You're not alone. When we're going through hard times, what's our, what's our primary thought? Nobody knows. Nobody gets this. The truth is, there are. Nick man sitting over here, God only knows what this week has been like. But there's other people in this congregation, lost little ones. They know that pain. They know that grief. Devil wants you in a cave, stuck. Gary wants you in a cave, stuck. What, what did God say to Elijah? Elijah, I got 7,000. He's not condemning Elijah here with this statement. He's comforting him. He had a time to condemn him with it, and he'd have been right if he had, but he doesn't. I got 7,000. Baby, you're not alone. I'm doing a thing on this earth that's way bigger than just our individual life. Elijah, I got things for you to do that are going to bless the next generation. Now, the only way Elijah was going to live successful was to do what? Get out of the cave and go do it. The only thing he had was a belief in what God had told him. But Elijah did it. He did it to the day God carried him out. Why? I'll tell you what I believe. Is because Elijah knew that God was in the things he said. I hear a lot of people tell me sometimes, they'll say, Brother, I don't know if God's called me to be saved or not. Oh, God will be in the things he said. God will call us to get saved and then we'll give ten other things. But God is in the things God said. I've seen a lot of people give up on a calling God put on their life because it didn't go easy. Dalton man got up here and spoke a while ago. I remember when Dalton got called to preach. Well, it's not easy. Or, well, I'm not doing this. Or, well, I'm not doing that. But what did it have to do with anything to do with what God said? The gifts of God are without or irrevocable. Old King James said, without repentance. In other words, God ain't changing his mind. As for our church, the things God set us out to do are still the things God wants us to do. He hasn't changed his mind. He's in the things he said. Now, it can be a long time between the time God says a thing and God does a thing. I'm going to tell you something. In Elijah's life, 
all three things, all three that he went out and anointed, none of them took their place in the kingdom until after he was gone. But it did mean God hadn't sent him. You following me? What's the things God's told you? Don't quit on it. Don't give up on it. Between the time when God says a thing and God does a thing is that's the opportunity for faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Follow me? Has God said anything to you? Is there anything you know that God has laid on your heart and you've run to a cave with it? He said, but Brother Taj, you just don't understand how I feel. Amen. Elijah felt the same way. God asked him this question twice. Elijah gave the same answer twice. After God, he heard God's voice, he gave the same answer. What does it mean? It means he still felt the same. But he was believing God. Everything I'm going to share with the church out of 1 Kings 19 came out of me praying this almost verbatim to God. Don't worry, it wasn't a long prayer. Lord, I know you're stirring me. I got these four things in my head. I believe you put them there because I can't put them to rest. Lord, I'm tired. I'm not the man I used to be. I can't think the way I used to think. I have messed up more than I've blessed. But I want confirmation. And Lord, I'm going to tell you, I think just from the way you're moving my spirit right now, I don't know that I'm going to feel any different when I leave this hotel room. Not that I don't believe you. It's just I know me. I've heard you speak, and I've run out in my own strength so many times and ran into the wall that, frankly, Lord, my nose is sore. I didn't say that in the prayer. I just said, but I am tired of hitting the wall. I don't know that I'm going to feel any different, but I do need to know what you're saying to me. And then God showed me, Elijah answered twice, same way. And I knew Elijah felt the same way. The difference was he knew what God had said and he was acting on it. I've spent my whole ministry telling people, it ain't, we don't do as we feel. We operate in faith. Do we believe God or not? And God just put me to the test on it. I don't know how, if your feeling's going to change, but is it time to take a step? Is God calling you to be saved? Is it time to act on it? Would you bow your head with me and close your eyes a second? Only, only we individually can answer what God may be or may or may not be saying in our own lives. I will say this. If you're a believer and God is giving, He's stirring you, He's wanting to move you, look for the command, a place to believe. Look for the promise, the thing to believe. Look for the comfort. God will increase you. He increased Elijah's knowledge so he could go out and do what he needed to do and believe that God will increase you. Recognize that what God is doing, he's doing in the whole family. If you're here tonight and you know God's calling you to be saved, Tonight's the night to be saved. It's time to stop the discussion and to start, it's time to start believing. You say, Brother Todd, I don't know if I'll feel... Hello. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope there was something that happened during the, the message or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that, uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus... The Son of God said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He seeks us and He calls us and He draws us to Himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're 
as you listen to the Word of God, you're, you're feeling Him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you, if God's moving you, to, to accept a challenge or uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that He's going to uh, help you, that He loves you, and that you're one of His children. Sometimes, as He talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes he does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see his son is the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's, he knows what he's talking about. He's, if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross, he paid that price, he rose from the grave, he's alive, and he can give us life. And the Bible tells us that when we, when we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, he enters into our life, he makes us his child, and he begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that he's rose from, uh, for us, that he wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the word of God. You hear belief and you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it, and we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place, and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him. And we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light, and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear, so to speak. Loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of God into your life. But it's real, and if you understand if uh, the things we talked about today in the message, what I'm talking about right now, if God's calling you, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. You need to come to that point of decision. Um, and the way you do that is to pray. Now, you don't need my help to do it. You can right now just ask the Lord to forgive your sins, tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross, he rose from the grave, that, that you want to repent of sin, turn from sin, and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith, and he will save you. The Bible says, for as many as have received him, and those that want to believe on him, the Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say, preacher, I don't really know what to say. In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. And say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. I'll try to follow you, to be my Savior, because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word and help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and just say amen. 
And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else. But uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net, and you found us here on the internet so I imagine you can probably find our homepage. just find us send us a note there's a way there to contact us you can call the church uh, if you're where you can get to a call or call into America it's 972-452-3751 and you can give us a call and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next I'm so proud for you so glad for you if if, if you can come back and be with us the next uh, simulcast, uh, the next podcast that goes out. Remember that uh, all of our, our videoed messages and even a lot of our audio messages are online. Uh, you'll find them archived uh, there in the website. If there's anything we can do for you, we'll try our best to do it. God bless you. We love you. And thanks again for coming by today.